Hello, and welcome to this introduction to the Doer Network and Fellows Program. I'm David Wiley, and I'm leading the Doer Network efforts inside the Open Education Group. Uh, today, I'm going to quickly overview the, the Doer Network. Uh, explain the acronym, talk about the Fellows Program, which is a, a small grants program uh, that they're, we're currently accepting applications for, talk about OER-enabled pedagogy, and then specifically how to apply for the grants program. So DOER stands for Designing with OER, and we're really focused on uh, design here specifically. The network, um, the, the purpose of the network is this. Uh, we know that OER adoption is linked to decrease costs for students, increased access, and the same or better academic outcomes. Uh, we also believe that OER adoption is hindered by a lack of understanding and expertise about how to do that. Um, there are some great professional development programs uh, being run right now with focuses on librarians or, and researchers, uh, but there's nothing really focused on people who actually design instruction. And so with funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, uh, we have created this doer network and the goal of the designing with OER network is to increase instructional designers capacity to design effective and engaging learning experiences with OER. The network is open, collaborative, particip participatory space. It's not restricted uh, to instructional designers. It's not restricted to fellows. And it's also recognized as a special interest, interest group uh, by AECT. There is a listserv uh, that you can find the link to in the comments below the video um, where you can ask questions about OER-enabled pedagogy, uh, get perspectives from others, uh, share interesting examples of OER-enabled pedagogy that you know about. And if you need a partner for the grant, because as I'll explain in a moment, the, the grants uh, are, are given out to partners, uh, the listserv might be a good place to, to look for those partners. The Fellows Program specifically, this mini grant program, now the goal of it is to create an active and really energetic core of people who are working in the context of the community to, to give us a core group to, to build and extend the network around. The grant program is specifically focused on supporting instructional designers and helping them skill up with OER and with OER-enabled pedagogy. And we're also trying to provide lots of exciting and engaging examples of OER-enabled pedagogy, which others can see, and by seeing these worked examples, understand what we're talking about and get excited about the idea of engaging in OER-enabled pedagogy. And we're doing that by offering small grants and other non-financial support. And I'll talk about those in more detail in a moment. But uh, I think I've said the words OER-enabled OER pedagogy about 10 times now. Let's, let's step back and take a moment and be clear about what that is. So open educational resources. If we're going to say OER-enabled pedagogy, let's be clear about what OER are. Open educational resources uh, are not resources which are free. I think there's frequently confusion uh, about this point. Uh, the entire internet is full of free resources like uh, everything on CNN, everything on YouTube, everything on Facebook is free for you to read. We're not talking about resources that are merely free. When we talk about open educational resources, we're talking about resources which are free and that grant us permission, permission to engage in what we call the 5R activities. And you can see them on the video screen here. They are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Um, and unless an educational resource that you're working with is explicitly licensed in a way that grants you permission to engage in these activities, that resource might be free that resource might be awesome, that resource might be effective at supporting student learning, but we would not call it an open educational resource. To be an open educational resource, a resource must be free and it must grant you permission to engage in these activities like making and owning a copy, being able to open the copy that you've made and change it and improve it in ways that will help it speak more directly to your students. Permission to take two or three or more uh, of resources and create a mashup where you bring them together uh, into something new. And then always, always, always permission to share either that verbatim copy that you retained originally or your adapted and improved copy or your mashup to share that freely with others under open licenses as well. So if you have an educational resource that is free and grants you these permissions, 
then we would call that an open educational resource. And the reason that uh, permission to engage in these activities is so important uh, will hopefully become clear here in a moment. Uh, so just to beat the drum, OER are resources that are free and give you permission to engage in these 5R activities. Um, there's probably at least a semester-long course in trying to define pedagogy here. I'm not going to try to dive really deeply into that. I'm just going to say pedagogy has to do with the theory and practice of teaching. And so if we bring those two things together, when we talk about OER-enabled pedagogy, what we mean is the set of teaching and learning practices that are only possible or only practical when you have permission to engage in the 5R activities. You might think about it this way. If it's true that we learn by the things we do, and I think many people would agree that that's true, uh, and it's certainly true that copyright restricts what we're allowed to do, then consequently copyright restricts the ways that we're permitted to learn because copyright prevents us from doing things and we learn by doing things. Uh, so open, as I've explained just a moment ago, removes some of these restrictions and gives us permission to do new things that we couldn't do before. And there's a lot of interest in the open community about whether or not this uh, permission to engage in these new activities really is going to create new ways for us to learn. And that's part of what we're trying to better understand uh, in both in the network and in the fellows program. I do think it's, it's a little unfair to say OER enabled pedagogy because uh, when we describe pedagogies, we normally uh, are making commitments to fundamental, uh, fundamental understandings about how teaching and learning work. And, and OER doesn't really do that. Um, I think it's probably more useful to have OER-enabled pedagogy as a very broad umbrella, but specifically underneath that to ask, what would permission to engage in these 5R activities enable that's new and different in the context of the way that you uh, teach and that you try to support your students in learning. So maybe OER enabled uh, is best used as a modifier of real pedagogies. For example, we might say an OER enabled constructionist pedagogy. And I want to pursue this example for a moment. Um, you know, Papert, uh, who's the father of constructionism, uh, said, you know, we learn best when we're actively engaged in constructing something that has a personal meaning to us whether it's a poem, a robot, a sandcastle, or a computer program. Um, so there's definitely a focus on making, on building here, and building something that's meaningful to us personally. And goes on to say that learning happens especially felicitously in a context where the learner is consciously engaged, not just in making, but, but in constructing a public entity. And so I think adding the idea of open, adding the idea of permission to engage in these 5R activities to a constructionist pedagogy lets us change not just from knowledge consumers to knowledge creators, as uh, many universities say is their goal to have students involved in knowledge creation, but also get students, uh, help them grow from knowledge creators into people who enable the knowledge creation of others. And I'll say a, a more about that in just a moment as well. You, you may have heard me speak about disposable assignments in the past. Uh, a disposable assignment to me is an assignment in which everyone involved, the student and the faculty member, both know that the ultimate destiny of that piece of student work uh, is the recycle bin. So take, for example, a two-page compare and contrast essay that uh, students write somewhat un unwillingly, faculty grade uh, somewhat unwillingly, and hand back to the student and regardless of how much time and effort has been put into uh, providing feedback on that, uh, it, it probably the student looks to see what their grade was and the paper just goes right into the bin. Um, students don't like doing that kind of work. Faculty, I believe, don't enjoy grading that kind of work. And my claim here isn't that that kind of work doesn't or can't support student learning. The claim here is just that it seems like there's a huge missed opportunity. I think it's conservative to say that collectively, college students in the US alone spend about 40 million hours a year doing homework. It's a lot of time. And is there not some way that we can take all that time and effort and help students 
change the focus of what they're doing so that instead of creating things that they're, they know are going to end up in the garbage can, can we help them find ways to spend their time creating things that support their own learning and actually add value to the world, have a life beyond uh, this little one-week window in which they're trying to do the work. Work that students could possibly enjoy doing and work that faculty could possibly enjoy grading. Um, it is difficult to recall sometimes, but students are people and everyone wants to feel like their work matters. And when you know that all the work that you're doing is going to end up in the recycle bin, that is pretty frustrating. Uh, perhaps you have had a professional assignment uh, maybe to serve on a committee or to do some other piece of work where you knew from the very beginning that all the time and effort that you invested uh, was not going to lead anywhere. That is, not, uh, that is not a positive, engaging, motivating environment to work in. You know, so uh, you know, we might think about the difference between disposable, authentic, constructionist, and renewable assignments as kind of walking along this pathway from do students actually create something? Does the thing that they create have personal meaning for them? Is it going to be shared publicly? And is it going to be available under an open license that grant permission to engage in these 5R activities? That's, that's a renewable assignment, one in which a student creates an artifact that has some meaning to them personally that they share publicly under an open license. So just let me give a few examples of these renewable assignments. And I'm just going to talk about them in the video here. The links will be below the video so you can click through and look at them. Um, the first is an example from medical school with a very interesting project where there's been an entire course created at UCSF uh, where students earn credit for improving the quality of information on public health topics in Wikipedia. Uh, Google is the first place that many of us go when we have a question, and the first place that Google points us to is frequently Wikipedia as it tries to answer that question. And so when you first learn that you have diabetes or you have something else and you go to the internet, you're very likely to end up at Wikipedia. And it would be great if the information that you read when you got there were as accurate and up to date as it can possibly be. And so here's an example of students doing work where instead of writing essays that they turn into a faculty member or research papers that they turn into a faculty member who grades them, hands them back, and they go in the garbage can, this work and writing is being done in a public space where other people will benefit it and is openly licensed so that others can come along and can contribute to, a la to it later. Great example of a renewable assignment. Um, and, and examples from graduate students, and these are from my own work. Uh, this middle example uh, here, pm for id this is Project Management for Instructional Designers. Um, this started with a collection of OER on project management, focused really uh, on students in the business school context. And I needed uh, to find some OER that I could use to replace a textbook for a course on project management that I had been assigned to teach to instructional designers. Um, and looking at this uh, collection of OER, I thought to myself, well, this, is, this has all the content that's right and is really very close to what I need, but there's a lot of work to be done to change this book from speaking to students in business schools to speaking to students in educational technology graduate programs. And uh, realized that one really positive way to uh, adapt this book and improve this book, to turn it into the book that students needed it to be, was to engage the students themselves in the process of updating and improving the book. And so as I taught this course over a couple of semesters, I invited students to help me change this book from a business school book into an ed school book. And so the kinds of assignments they would have from week to week, uh, instead of taking quizzes or writing essays, would be things where they were shooting video or rewriting case studies or creating new assignments, or, or things that change the book from a business school book into an ed school book. And over a series of semesters, um, the book improved significantly, and now it's used at institutions other than BYU, where I was at uh, when I engaged in this activity. So again, students are doing work, uh, and the same is true here as in the med school example. They're starting from resources that give them permission to engage in these 5R activities, to make improvements, to make remixes, and to share their resulting work. They're starting from there, 
adding their own improvements and contributing to a resource now that is used by lots of other people and uh, that they understand adds value beyond uh, the learning that they individually got from their engagement with those resources. A couple of examples from undergraduate students. Uh, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem uh, is a great example of uh, a course about Latin American literature in English translation where a faculty member invited students who were in the course to create, in many cases, create from scratch, uh, articles on Wikipedia about lesser known Latin American authors and challenge them to make these articles so high quality that the Wikipedia community would recognize them as being very high quality and actually feature them on the front page of Wikipedia for a day. And some of the students in this class succeeded in that task in having their articles featured on the Wikipedia homepage. The Anthology of Early American Literature is another great example that you can look at. A course that previously was taught using a uh, commercial anthology that was filled with public domain lit works of literature but had proprietary uh, introductions and contexts and historical settings and discussion questions and things like that. And in the case uh, of this example, uh, Robin worked with her students to rewrite and replace those proprietary pieces of context of historical background, the discussion questions and things like that, and openly license those so that they could be wrapped around those public domain works so that now here's an anthology that is completely open that can be used instead of having to depend on uh, a very expensive collection of freely available public domain works uh, provided by a publisher. And there's even a great example uh, from middle and high school context at Mountain Heights Academy, which is uh, an online uh, middle and high school located here in Utah, where I am, that has a particular focus on using OER across its entire curriculum for all of its courses. And their next generation OER project is a project in which they engage students in creating OER that faculty can review, check for quality, and integrate into the official version of the course that students next year, coming along behind the current class of students, will actually use as they're learning that content. And the link here is to an article from a, uh, that we just published looking at the relationship between students creating uh, OER for a digital photography course uh, and changes in learning, uh, or at least changes on grades and assignments over time as more and more student-created OER was added to that course. Uh, quite interesting example there. There are many more examples on the Open Ed Group website. I'd encourage you to go have a look at those. And I, I do want to say, too, that I, I think there's a secondary benefit to this kind of work uh, and interest in OER-enabled pedagogy in terms of how we sustain the OER movement over time. Right? If, if the current model of producing OER sufficient to replace an entire textbook uh, is a model where it costs half a million dollars uh, to do everything that needs to be done so that a faculty member can adopt OER instead of a textbook, that's just not sustainable. There's not enough grant funding in the world to, to keep paying half a million or a million dollars per course for all the courses that we want to teach across higher ed and K-12. Um, in the U.S., as we've said before, undergraduates spend tons of hours doing homework every year. Um, so is there a way that students can engage in the process of creating OER? And can they are they capable of creating OER that can support their own learning and the learning of other students? And the initial answer to this question appears to be yes. And again, see the uh, have a look at the article that I shared above. And anecdotally, I know as I've talked to people who've engaged in this kind of work, students find this work much more engaging than they do the traditional things we ask them to do. So it seems like they're, um, in addition to being better for students, uh, having them more engaged, having them creating things of real value that go out into the world and, and have the ability to improve other people's lives. Um, that there are some benefits to the movement uh, itself here as well. So how, how do you apply to become a Doer Fellow? How do you apply for one of these mini grant programs? Um, the answer is you go to this link at the bottom here and you'll find the application there, bit.ly slash Doer Fellows. And to apply, you need to be an instructional designer. You need to find a faculty partner and then together you need to select one to three specific 
OER that could be used uh, in a class. And then what you do is you'll propose three renewable assignments that you want to create. Each of those renewable assignments aligned specifically to an OER. All three of them might be aligned to the same OER if you choose a very big OER like uh, something from OpenStax. Or if you've chosen smaller OER, uh, each, resource, each assignment might be aligned with a single OER. And then commit to, of course, license everything uh, that you'll submit as a grant deliverable under a CC BY license. And that's what you need to do to apply for one of the grants. And in terms of the money for the grants, $500 will go to the instructional designer and $250 will go to the faculty partner. Now, what if you succeed? Uh, let's be a little more specific about the, del the, the deliverables here. Um, and you can read this uh, on the Doer Network uh, website, on the Open Ed Group uh, site. But these are the kinds of things that you're going to need to do specifically. I'll just let you pause and read through them. I'm not going to go through them. Um, I'm not going to read them to you on the video here. And moving on, here's the rest of that explanation. I'll let you pause and read again. And I also want to add that um, you know the Open Ed Group also runs the uh, OER Research Fellows Program, and that's a program that's been going on for several years that the Doer Fellows Program is modeled on. And if you're interested in uh, pilot testing these assignments that you create and looking to see what kind of impact they have, I think there are great opportunities for Doer Fellows and OER Research Fellows to collaborate on that kind of work. So thanks very much for taking a few minutes uh, to listen to this uh, explanation of what we're trying to do with the Doer Network and the Fellows Program and what OER Enabled Pedagogy is about. I look forward to seeing your applications for the Fellowship Program and to seeing you on the listserv. Thanks very much.